Hello, and welcome to Save Your Sanity Livestream. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. I'm glad you're joining us. I was to have a guest today. However, I have not seen her pop into the studio. So uh, if she does come along, we will uh, certainly engage her in the conversation. But I didn't want to not talk about this topic. Um, so I'm just going to talk about it for a short while here. And as you join us, if you have any questions or you have any examples, things that you might like to add to the question about overcoming trauma bonds, you can certainly feel free to engage. And uh, that would be the purpose of the Facebook Live. You know, you can always find me... Um, on the website, and you can, that is at SaveYourSanityPodcast.com. That's where you will find all my podcast episodes. But also, when you want to just learn about me and my work, you can go to ForRelationshipHelp.com. And also, if you're a YouTube person and you want to find me there, there's over 550 videos, and my YouTube name is for relationship help. So youtube.com slash for relationship help. So all of these things are available for you all the time. And often I do pop in with a guest, someone who's been on the podcast or is going to be on the podcast. And that would have been the case today. I was going to be talking with the author of the book, No More Trauma Bonding. However, if she pops in, we will engage her with that conversation. Otherwise, I just wanted to join you. So people ask me so frequently, what is trauma bonding? And yes, it sounds like everybody should know just by the name, but what it really is, is this horrible tug and pull that happens when someone uh, abuses you and they really hurt you. And yet they've got you so isolated that when they hurt you, you end up going to uh, them for consolation. And that's really important. So I see that my guest has arrived <laughs> um, and I will bring her into the conversation. Yes. Hi, Roberta. How are you? I'm well, Nadine. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, great. Well, I was concerned you weren't going to come because... Oh, no. It just, I had to switch my preferences and I just finished a session. So excuse yeah. my happiness. No, that's okay. I was all set to talk for a while with folks about the topic, but I'm glad that you're here, everybody. This is Dr. Nadine Macaluso. She's the author of the book, No More Trauma Bonding. And so we, I was just beginning to define trauma bonding and why we need to recognize that isolation that the abuser puts us in, then wants to be the one who abuses, and then is the only one we turn to for solace or for comfort or for reinforcement and getting a reward after they've punished us. That's right. So, yeah. So how would you define it? Well, I would respond to what you just mentioned as, yeah, the isolation piece is very important because when someone's been abusive to you, and as you said, you have nobody else to go to, but then the next week they say, hey, we're going to go on a vacation, right? You're like, oh, you feel relief. You feel grateful that finally <laughs> the abuser is being kind to you. And you don't have anybody else to really reconcile the experience against. And that's why they like to keep you in isolation. Right. And an, an additional piece to that that some people may recognize is they say, oh, well, let's go on a vacation. And you get all thrilled and you think, oh, they want me around. This is wonderful. And then they engage in future faking. So they're never really going to take you on that vacation. But they gave it to you as a wonderful thought present. Ooh. And then they don't do it. So there are different levels. Of yeah. And it. sometimes they do do it, which confuses the person, right? Because 
kindness mixed with cruel cruelty is very confusing. Yes, and sometimes they do do it. And then what actually is the, the reality is that you are then further isolated with them in some unusual place and you can't get away from them and they begin to be abusive. Yep. Or it's, that can be nice. I mean, it, it just depends upon their mood or what they want or. Yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. Which, the, which way the weather's blowing. <laughs> exactly. It has nothing to do with you is the point. That is the point. And, and it's a very important point for everybody listening to take on board because the behavior of the hijackal, the narcissist, whomever, the person who is perpetrating the abuse is nothing to do with you. It's everything to do with them. Exactly. And I don't mean to say you don't have a part in it. You do. I mean, you are actually engaging in the relationship. Obviously, you're a part of it. But when they're telling you how wrong you are or how inadequate you are or or if they're building you up or whatever they're doing, it's all about them needing something, wanting something, manipulating the situation. And they are trying to make sure they have the ultimate control. So they will do whatever they do, but don't believe the press that they give you about yourself because that's very seldom the truth. Yes. And I um, actually, the more and more research that I've done as, as a doctor of somatic psychotherapy and a relational trauma expert, it becomes more and more apparent to me how many of the victims or people that have been on the other side of the abuse feel so much shame. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't have done that. I'm codependent. Well, guess what? An abuser's going to abuse anybody. A strong person, a codependent person, a weak person, a disabled person, their own child, their wife, it has nothing to do with your personality, except that you're probably loyal and kind and agreeable. Mm -hmm. it, and maybe a little healthier than the other person. Yeah, and pathology will always trump normalcy. Exactly. And always. Uh, everybody hear that one. Pathology will always trump normalcy. And I've even stopped using the word normal and replaced it with healthier. Yeah, because we don't know what normal really is, but what we do know what healthier relationships yes. are, and yes. the, these ones are certainly not that. And so, trauma bonding occurs, but it can be created in you by your parents, it can be created in you by a partner or a nasty sibling, mm -hmm. or even after your kids grow up by a narcissistic adult child, can't it? Yes, that is the unfortunate truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that it's very important for people to understand is that there are many benefits to being an abuser. Yeah. Right. They get mm -hmm. power and control. They get people to work for them at their will. They get to do whatever they want, whenever they want. So, you know, people say, well, why do they do it? Because there's a they can. benefits, <laughs> but they get benefits from doing it. Yeah. They expect you to work for them at their will. Yes, it's, it's similar, Nadine, to what I say. My opinion is why uh, hijackals have children. They want to have someone to agree with them. They want someone to serve their purposes. And they want someone to validate them by making them look good. And if as a child you don't do those things, you can become very trauma bonded looking for that approval, looking for all those things, which they are absolutely dedicated not to give you. And that's a really poor start in the world, isn't it? Yes, it is. And so, and here's the thing though, is that, yes, if you were abused or if you have complex PTSD or experience relational trauma, you are due to your attachment structure insecure, right? And that's no fault of your own. You can go back to secure attachment. You're just not going to get that with this person. And, and yet people that are abusers, they also find people that what my research has discovered, 
people that are agreeable and conscientious. Yes. So don't assume because you end up with someone like this, you're damaged or no, no, no. You fell into that lap. They're very tricky. They're very hard to get away from. Maybe it's because you have insecure attachment. Maybe it's because you have insecure attachment and you're a chronic caretaker, or maybe you're also just a simply a nice person. <laughs> yes. Or, and I would add to nice and or, successful mm -hmm. because one of the things i've really learned by doing all this work for so many years in this field as you have is that they really see a successful person as a challenge to find where that successful person's vulnerabilities are excoriate them and then weaponize them they will find a way to bring down or try to find a way to bring down a successful person or they'll use the traits of conscientiousness which the big five personality pattern tests and conscientious people are orderly they're dutiful they're achievement striving they're organized that's also very useful to an abuser right absolutely and so i hope everybody is realizing you know there was it's not about something wrong with me it's right. about something wrong with the pattern here mm -hmm. and what the other person is experiencing so uh ekaterina has said hello to us hello, hello. <laughs> uh, and, and also mystique has said hello hello and then, and then we have a question from Joanne. Can anyone explain the neurobiology in simple terms? Would you like to do that for her? Sure. What happens with someone that is an abuser? So we have three parts of the brain. I call it the wise owl, the emotional brain, which is the whiny puppy, and this part of the brain, which is the reptilian crocodile brain. And so people that are abusers really work from the emotional brain and the reptilian brain. They don't use their wise prefrontal cortex because they're not very reflective. They don't have insight. They don't have empathy. So they're very emotional and they're very impulsive, which comes from the reptilian crocodile brain. Just think of a crocodile. It's impulsive. Just think of a whiny puppy. I want this. I want this. They don't have the wise owl that says, ooh, even though you want this, let me think about this. Maybe how is this going to impact another person? So this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex that we work on in therapy is not highly developed in an abuser. No, and, and let's put this piece into the mix for Joanne too, is that in brain development, we are not getting development in any meaningful way of the parietal and prefrontal uh, lobes yeah. until we're five or six years old. Mm -hmm. And so we're um, all that goes into us and into that abuser before that time is hugely significant to that emotional center mm -hmm. that is going to rule the roost, right? <laughs> yes, that, that is true. I mean, yeah, the left brain doesn't even come online until 18 months old, which is the more cognitive aspect. So it's the right brain for the first two years of life. Mm -hmm. But the thing about the brain is that we know it has neuroplasticity, at least neurons do. And so, but it works both ways. It can work for the worse or for the better, depending upon what your environment is. And also most abusers are entitled Entitled people do not use their prefrontal cortex and reflect upon how their actions impact the people they love. And imagine someone without that reflective ability is going to be a bit of a bulldozer. Yes. And also there's a belief system and a value system that, that allows them to believe that this is the way they should be. Yeah, they don't have to be like us. They're different. Mm -hmm. And they were raised to be different in most cases. You know, when you're little and you want someone to love you, mm 
You want someone to make sure that you don't die, that you don't die of exposure or starvation. You want someone to tell you you're worthwhile and you're welcome. You want all of that. You become very, very concerned and develop your attachment style by how do they like me so far? How, how am, am I worthwhile? Am I welcome? And so if they got messages that they weren't welcome, they would begin to adapt to how do I get seen? How do I get what I want? How do I get what I need? How do I keep the giants happy? Just like all of us who are maybe a healthier beginning, we learn the same things, but we learn to reflect on ourselves differently. Whereas the hijackal doesn't learn that. They're right. Also, but also, Roberta, what I want to say is that what I think is very important is that temperament plays a part. And mm -hmm. And temperament is shaped a lot by hormones, okay? So men are born with testosterone, which is a dominant hormone, and females are born with more estrogen and progesterone and oxytocin and all those bonding hormones. And so temperament also plays into the equation. So then you combine temperament, somebody's biology, with their biography, with mm -hmm. their parents, so if you have a highly dominant child whose parents aren't, don't set boundaries with them and tell them whatever they do is great, they're going to go into the world and not expect boundaries and think that everything they do is great. Right. So when we try to set boundaries with them, we become wrong. <laughs> yes. Sure. And, you know, I often say to my clients, Nadine, you didn't break them. You can't fix them. You know, you weren't there in the beginning. You weren't part of how they became the way they are. Yeah. And your part in it is not to fix them, you know. And that's very empowering for people to hear yes. that because there's so healthier <laughs> figuring well there's a way through there's a way around if i just do this if i stay out of the way if i ask the right question if i choose the right time then yep. in a healthier relationship all those things would work but they don't happen to be as effective when you're in the relationship with a hijackal no they don't they don't because if somebody can't hear you they can't change and learn. And it's like that old joke, you know, how many psychotherapists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. Yes. Yes. Well, if a person is feeling superior and is so fearful of shame, which is what we know about people in the hijackal category, um, they are constantly on the lookout for anything that could be six blocks away and might potentially be shaming. They are already fighting against it. So when we're in the situations like that, we can't possibly cause them to change their minds and the way that they perceive themselves in the world and their rights. It's right. not something that we as their partners can do. No, I, I think the only way to change them is to leave them and see what they do after that. Yes, and that's a tricky business. That's a tricky experiment. <laughs> I well, think it's that worth it because if you leave, you save yourself. And if they change, you get to choose if you go back. But well, standing for the same behavior over and over again never works. No, it doesn't. And also thinking, I mean, there's so many things that people say when they come in, aren't there? Like, oh, well, what about the children? And I have to stay for financial oh, reasons. Yeah. And there's so many mitigating circumstances. And every case is different, I find. Yeah, you know, those mitigating circumstances, like, I mean, there is a reality to life. Mm -hmm. You know, to having the financial rug pulled from you by leaving somebody like that. And you will be okay. You will be okay. It may be a rough patch, but you will be okay. And that's so important to recognize. Yes, Roberta, I love the word you love. You 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 uh, coined hijackles. Mm -hmm. And I ask you how you came up with that. I sure. Um, first of all, the reason I came up with it was 
you know, people don't have the training that you or I have. We don't right. want people diagnosing people using right. Dr. Google. <laughs> right, right, right. But what was really important to me was to have a way without diagnosing or, or uh, describing them in clinical terms was to have a word that said, here's how these people generally behave. We're just going from a behavioral, cyclical traits point of view. Okay. Um, and so when I created hijackals, it's because I define it as these are people who hijack relationships for yeah. their own purpose and interests yes. and then proceed to scavenge the relationship for power, status, and control. Got it. Okay. Okay. Right? So yes. it's been kind of fun, Nadine, because no, I, mean, I, call, I call them intimate terrorists, which is kind of the same, which is not probably mm -hmm. politically correct. But I, I, I no, I now I appreciate that. I love it. I just was curious as you came up with it. Well, and it's been fun to watch the the growth of it and the evolution. Yeah. I've had people write to me and say, I've been hijackled again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Oh, it's so the, good. It's good. It's good. It's a good time. Yeah, it has a life of its own. So Joanne yeah. asked this a question. Why not legally require psychiatric evaluations and maybe even spec brain scans for both partners before a marriage license is issued <laughs> to help screen out at least some of the seriously toxic hijackals? Yeah. Well, that would be a trick, wouldn't it? Well, <laughs> I, mean, I, I can answer that. The thing about brain scans and the thing about the brain is that we have more neurons and more connections in our brain than we do with, with all the stars and the galaxies. And so, yes, we can measure neurons, but there's also so many glial cells that we can't track. Mm. So, uh, you know, we really can't image the brain the way we can the heart, the liver, and that's the problem of it. I do believe, though, in a psychological assessments, and I have many psychological assessments that I give many of my patients, all of my patients before they come, the big five personality pattern. I give them an attachment assessment and the norm assessment, which is a theory that I'm well-versed at. And so I don't know that you can do that to your partners, but if you bring them to therapy, a good therapist would do that to teach you about your partner if you went to couples therapy. And I always say that we give more training to anybody, um, you know, people that check out us, check us out at the grocery store or people that work at the paint store. And I'm not saying that to any way you know, not be kind to those people. They do a great job. It's just that parenting is the hardest job in the world. Why don't we at least test people to parent, <laughs> right? I mean, you, we yeah. test them to drive, but we don't train people to love. We don't train people to parent. We don't train people to be relational. So as much as I agree with assessments, because I do, let's start with educating people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we if we were educated in even self awareness during our school system years, to actually be self reflective, to have some sense of how the world works, right. instead of everything by trial and error in history and geography, I think that would be a really good start. You know, um, when I was raising my three kids alone and. I was working full time and had my private practice, and and it was it was really of interest to me to see. I was principal of a school for at risk children, uh, acting principal, and um, that these kids were just really lacking in attachment. Obviously, you know, um, so very difficult. But to be able to talk to them about things, you know, I I remember at one time Nadine, I I had eighteen kids that I was talking with and I said just out of interest how many of you eat a meal with your family each week right and what I learned was that it the range was from there is no food to there is food get it if you want there's food on the stove come and get it there's food please sit down with us and right you know, um, and of that, on that spectrum, 
one child out of 18 ate one meal a week with their family. Wow, that's so, that's so, that's so, you know, I feel that in my heart. And, you know, I mean, we teach children reading, writing, and arithmetic. We don't teach them how to feel. We don't teach them how to name what they're feeling, how to express their emotions healthily. I mean, when you think about how many hours we are in relationship to people, mm-hmm. and if you go to therapy for one hour a week, that's not that long, considering no. all the other things you do, exercise in front of your computer, watching movies, eating. We need to learn about love and relationships, and that's why we're doing this podcast. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I could be eating with my husband right now, just go for it. <laughs> but I'm here with Roberta because I believe in what you're wanting to educate people about. Right, so, and I'm glad you are. Uh, We have another comment here from Flutterby. Currently in a position where someone else has been brought into the equation. I just reached out to her as a friend, but I know she loves an idea of him that isn't the reality I know. And, you know, I talk about that so frequently on the podcast, Nadine, that hijackles paint a public picture of perfection Mm -hmm. while at home they provide a private place of pain. Oh, yeah. And here's what Flutterby is is suggesting. The public picture of perfection of this person is sometimes very difficult to dislodge when you want to say, no, here's how they are really. Yes. And and that that's an important piece of the puzzle. Yes, because you have to remember that image and if you if you feel insecure, just think about it. What people think of you is very important because you need to be externally validated from the outside. So that's why their image is very important. And that's why they're not abusive in public or they hide it in public and they only save it for you. So I can only imagine how frustrating that is for you. And I'm sorry that, you know, it doesn't get validated by your friend, but keep speaking your truth. That's important. Not to change anybody's opinion, but just to give voice to your truth is very empowering and it's very important. It is so important. And we have a little note from Simply Savvy who says they're glad they made it. (laughs) (laughs) That that they... that the uh, last few topics have synchronized with their life. (laughs) So I'm glad you're here too. So here's a question. I'm trying to rejuvenate myself. Is my past trauma still accountable for my present stress? For sure. Yeah. The thing about trauma is that it overwhelms our ability to cope. So we don't cope in our normal ways. And when we feel traumatized, the world feels unsafe. And so when the world feels unsafe or people feel unsafe, we avoid. So the number one response to trauma is to avoid, is to hide, is to feel shame. And so definitely post-traumatic stress from a relationship like that or post-traumatic embitterment (laughs) distress is real. Mm -hmm. So I recommend... Uh, Kristen Knapp's self-compassion meditation. And she has a whole website about self-compassion as a way to counteract the trauma that you've dealt with. A good plan, because the question is well taken. You know, is my past trauma still accountable for my present stress? Yes, and you're going to have stress every day just because the world is noisy, um, because things are being asked of you in a, in a moment's notice. I mean, there are all kinds of things that stress us. But when we are already up-leveled by things that have happened to us before, yes, this all becomes a, a, a piece, and it's all indistinguishable one from the other at a certain point in time. That's right. So very important to to work through the trauma, you know, get some help to work through the trauma, mm-hmm. to know how to manage that yourself as a result of that work, and then recognize that when that wants to chime in, you know, we're all a bit like a piano. 
that we have all these strings from the past and, and up till now, but when one gets plucked, all of them resonate. Sure. So it, it's really important for us to know that, okay, there will be a bit of this and a bit of that. Let me sift and sort that out and let me see what I'm really dealing with in the moment. So I hope that helps you, Rondell. And Ocasio, the question of are we early today? No, this is an extra bonus. Uh, every Monday evening at 7 p.m. Pacific, I do my podcast. <laughs> so that's why she's asking this question. <laughs> no, this is a bonus for you. So let's go back to talking about overcoming trauma bonding. Yeah. Um, this this abuse, console, and comfort thing, it can get very, very, um, quite quite a broad spectrum from too high to too low, right? What do you, that, what do you I mean? mean? Well, I mean that, that you can be like super abused and then the person goes way over the top trying to console you. Okay. And so you, you, you hurt, 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 hurt. Oh, wonderful. Great. Hurt, hurt, hurt. And you just get into these cycles of abuse. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, then it reinforces the dependence on that person, you yes. think. Yes, right? that's actually why we call it traumatic bonding, because it's that emotional dependence of the intensity and passion mixed with the intense cruelty that people mistaken for love. But actually, that it's that intense those intense spectrums that actually create the bonding, I think within mm -hmm. our hormones and our endocrine system, for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and it all kind of flies under our radar. We're really aware of the abuse, but we've got that part that Nadine spoke about earlier. Well, you know, did I do something? Did I make a mistake? Am I the wrong one? And so we've got all that going on. And then they, they turn around and they want something from you often sex <laughs> and so they start being lovely to you and you're like which of these people is real right yeah. um and it becomes very very confusing yes. um flutter by added something here i'm aware i cannot tell her who he is it's very hard for me to be quiet i'm reaching out to her as me i'm not including him in the conversation i've met her and she was hurt but was that me <laughs> is very convoluted <laughs> i'm not sure who, who the who the pronouns refer I to know. it's very hard for me to be quiet um reach oh so maybe um well i mean i would i've met her and she was hurt well if you've both been hurt gang up together yeah, well, if she has been hurt and you have been hurt, at least you have that commonality. Yeah. Neither one of you are suggesting that this person is as delightful as that person wants to have you believe. <laughs> no, and I think it's secrets, actually, that the hijackal, I'm going to use Roberta's word, will actually rely on the fact that you might feel shame or the other person feels shame and and secrecy and them being a mystery is actually what really propels their abuse further. Name it, tame it, call them on it. See what happens. Things change when you do that because they don't expect that. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because we kind of differ on that point. You know, I tell my people all the time, never poke a hijackal. Oh. <laughs> so, so let's just talk about how you go about doing that that is not poking. Well, how I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, only because if you're going to stay, you need to, you need to give, um, you need to name it to tame it. And even if you're not taming it for them, you know what's happening. Listen, whether you poke them or they don't poke them, they're going to be abusive. So it really doesn't matter. But if you really want to know who you're dealing with, set a boundary, tell them no, oh, yeah. call them on their bullshit. And mm -hmm. if they get over the top angry or defensive, or if you think you're, they're cheating on you and they get defensive and say, no, it's you who's cheating on me. You know, you're being lied to. Mm -hmm. I think, listen, nobody wants to get into a fight, but 
you can't deny yourself and abandon yourself because they're going to get mad at you anyway. Well, that's true. And I think we've just cleared up something. I mean, I tell people, once you know who they are and you have expressed all these things, there's no point poking them any further. You know, to get into conversations like, well, you're so narcissistic. No, you're narcissistic. Uh, That whole thing is just a waste of energy. I see that. Yeah, so so basically we're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying to get into like a, a pissing match about you said, he said, she said, and give the facts, state your case, state your truth, see if they're defensive, if they're defensive and get abusive. And if you set boundaries, they plow through them. You know where you're at. And Absolutely. They say, no, I didn't say that. You heard me wrong. What are you talking about? I don't remember that. Like they start putting word salad. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. And trust your body. Trust what you feel, not what your brain says. Yeah, that's an important point for sure. We've got lots of people with the questions here for us. Okay. So trying to develop a healthy relationship, ex hijackal and close proximity. The amount of questioning myself is crazy. How much residual exists? I don't want to hinder a good relationship. So you're in a relationship with a healthier person now is what I'm reading here. And yet the hijackal, the ex is lurking around. Um, so you are second guessing the healthy relationship. Is that what's going on? I think we can go from that point, Nadine, that perhaps that's what they're doing. What would you say? Well, of course, the ex hijackal is trying to get you back. I mean, that is classic, right? You're, you left him, you're happy, you're getting an experience of something different, And so, yes, it is completely normal for the hijackal to put questions in your brain. That's what they do. That's what they're good at. Mm -hmm. But remember what you dealt with. And I actually would do no contact because there's nothing good that's going to come out of contacting with a person like that. And focus on a person that's good to you. Mm -hmm. A person that wants to be close to you, wants to be kind to you. I know that might feel scary, but just turn towards that person and see what happens and close the door on the abuse. You can do it. Yes, you sure can. And I think I I can read a little bit into this that brings up another question Mm -hmm. is that in that second guessing yourself, you may be second guessing the new relationship to say, do I really deserve to have this lovely relationship? Do I deserve to be treated this way? And that contrast, once the the ex-hijackal is still lurking, will keep you in that question. But no, yes, you do. You do do. deserve it. Go for it. Go for it. (laughs) Absolutely. So I don't want you to hinder a good relationship or one that could be good. But I also understand that when you've been with the hijackal, you start to see hijackal everywhere and you get very concerned that, am I reading the red flags significantly? Sure. And listen, the the brain and body will go for familiar, even if it's bad for us. So we have to fight against that inclination. Absolutely. That's a good point. So Ekaterina says, I'm afraid of their double pattern. In five minutes, you can hear, I don't believe in love. And then I love you. And they do. They're constantly giving us these differing points of view. I think one important thing here uh, is that we always have to remember that Top of, them, top of mind for a hijackal when they get up in the morning, if they were that conscious, which they're not, but would be <laughs> the need to win, the need to win in every moment, the need to be yeah. right, the need to get the edge to do all of that. Mm-hmm. So that double pattern here is I don't believe in love is I needed to win at that moment. Now they want something different. I love you. They need something different from you at that moment. So to win in each situation, they could say things that are 180 degrees apart. Right, because you, you, you used a very important word, their need. It's all about what they need in the moment. Your needs are never taken into consideration. 
Never. I want to use the word never. And I, and I always say as a therapist, never, don't use the word never. <laughs> or I'm, always. <laughs> I'm going to use it. So if their needs are only what's important, they're going to say whatever they can say to meet their needs. Yeah. Without thinking about your needs. Yes, absolutely. So good to keep that in mind. I don't know that we're going to get to a lot about trauma bonding further, but we'll certainly answer these questions for a little longer. So here's another one. It's hard to tell the difference between being smart and healthy and being hypervigilant. See, that's exactly what Simply Savvy was saying earlier. Yes, it is difficult within yourself. You know, other people looking at it can help you with the smart and healthy versus hypervigilant. But I understand the confusion within yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's also think about what a healthy relationship is, what a healthy person is. I mean, a healthy person knows where they begin and they end and is okay with having boundaries with another person, but yet still being connected with them. You can, everyone can be connected and within their power, which means that only the ability to influence themselves, have agency, express their authentic selves and be connected with another person and give that other person the space to, to love them and to love themselves. And so hypervigilant, which of course, after being in a relationship like that is normal. So have compassion for yourself. But that means you're quickly looking to judge another person. And that's okay for you right now because trust has to be earned. So take your time with it. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, Simply Savvy, that Nadine shared with you. There's no rush, but be kind to yourself. Be gentle on yourself. Know that that shift from hypervigilant to come to a place where you feel safe allowing that to go back in your toolkit you don't have to use it every day as you did when you were with the hijack call you can you can use it when you need it but it doesn't have to be the thing that you do every day anymore right and and over time you're listening to this that means you're doing the work you'll grow you'll get you'll you'll heal Yes, and and even the questions that you're answering, asking here, are showing the growth exactly. that you're. At. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. Um, that that's my thought on the on the issue too, Joanne. So I'm glad that you said that. And here's something else from Simply Savvy. It's especially hard developing at long distance without the benefit of observing behavior. Oh, here we go. It's a long distance relationship that you're not concerned you're concerned about. I send myself into a tizzy with overthinking, questioning, and fear of poking the hijackle bear. Um, so maybe you're thinking that there is a hijackle bear in this new long distance relationship and you're afraid that they'll come out, poke away because (laughs) time to poke away. Exactly. Let's find out. Yes. Especially when there's great geographical distance between you poke, see what happens. Yes. Ask to have your needs met. Those are two great ways to find out. Mm-hmm. And fear is normal after you've been in a relationship like that. Oh, so normal. Yes. So KX says, yes, it feels vulnerable to want and need after being with these yes. types of people. Yeah, it does. You know, it the recalibration that you require after you have left a hijackal relationship or especially if you were raised by hijackals, then had a hijackal partnership and then got out of it, mm-hmm. learning to trust yourself again mm-hmm. is a slow process. Yes. Learning to trust other people again is an even slower process. Yeah. So, and I we, think it's a practice, you know, mm-hmm. we don't change overnight. I mean, practicing self care, self compassion. Um, you know, having the courage to express your, you know, your beliefs with, with safe people, going to therapy, joining a group, going to Codependence Anonymous. I mean, there are resources out there to utilize that you can slowly really develop a stronger sense of self where you can 
And then when you feel that, then you can be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Hijack all his custody and income, but I own the house we share. Ooh. You're yep. walking, walking the razor's edge there. Yes. I understand I mean, that. A lot of hijackals, that's what they do, right? They use the system to their benefit. But I would highly suggest um, looking up a man named Lundy Bancroft. Mm -hmm. He's really smart and has a great book that actually I have on my table because I just finished it. Why does he do that? <laughs> And, um, yeah, there's a lot of great resources out there to help you through that. Absolutely. And here's Isabel chiming in with what we said about go ahead and poke. When you say no, you'll find out who they are. <laughs> and and that's so important. And, and that has been agreed with by Flutter By. Yes. Uh, and, and guess what? We have to be able to say no. Oh, we absolutely have to be able to say no. They have undeveloped part of their brains, yes. Yes, they do. Why do I think their hearts? Well, yes, because empathy and heart have to go together. Yeah. And if we're empathy deficient, actually allowing the heart to grow and feel and all, the connection just isn't there. That's right. It really isn't there. So... Flutterby said, my other half takes photos of me while I sleep. That's not uncommon, I'm sad to say. Told me. And has told me his ideal life is living in a remote farmhouse where I'm chained up in the cellar. He literally expresses that as love. No, that's isolation to set you up for a lifetime of abuse. Yes. Well, right. So I would get into therapy. I would get into a codependency group. They're free. Yes, I would definitely buy the book. Yeah, I don't think living in a remote farmhouse with someone who wants to chain you up is a good idea. No, and let me add something to the way that you've expressed that flutter by, because I understand what you're saying. They paint, the hijackal likes to paint this romantic picture. You know, we could go off grid, we could grow our own food, we could do all these wonderful, wouldn't that be wonderful? But the underlying text is, let me get you somewhere where I can take your car away, your keys away, and have ultimate control over you well, as well. In the cellar? No. No, no, no. not at all. But but, no, but, but the, the journey to that, place that you're talking about flutter by is the picturing of it as romantic like this would be wonderful this would but this person is telling you like straight up run yeah <laughs> no, no 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 chains no no chains no no uh, no opportunity to take a photograph of you in your sleep no because you're a free person who has autonomy and you and, get to decide who takes your picture right Absolutely. And you're sleeping because you don't have a voice then. No, oh, that's very sad. It's time to um, move on for sure. Um, Ekaterina says their needs bring to their lie. They're, they draw in their fantasies. I had an exam a relationship with an actress. In reality, they don't know each other. Oh, you mean the real person and the actress don't know each other? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good um, a good metaphor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the mask, right? One person one day and the other person behind the right. Right. Like, big wall left today and left the hijackal home to visit this friend. Yes, take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're on the right path. I'm, I'm glad that you're sharing that with us. Now, here's a question from Lisa. Is there a way to start the healing process while still being in the relationship and living under the same roof? And is there a way to identify how much I've been damaged in this relationship? What are the effects that I might display? Whoa, there's a whole program. <laughs> um, yes, there is a way to start the healing process in the relationship. That's why I created my membership my emerging empowered community yeah. so that you can be leaving the relationship emerging empowered and you know if that if that's of interest to anybody 
you just go to joinintoday.com and come on over and join the Emerging Empowered community. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I like to remind people that it's a good idea to become empowered before you leave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, while you're in the relationship, I use the word differentiate, but it's a fancy word for meaning what are you interested in? What do you like? What are your hobbies? What do you want to do? What friends do you want to see? Try to carve out some time for those things because those things build internal strength in us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they absolutely do. And, And it's important for us to take that into consideration. Now, we are getting so many questions here. I just have to check our timing. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're done. But um, I just want to answer this question, too. Yeah, please do. Is there a way to identify how much I've been damaged in the relationship? Uh, you know, I, I'd like to change the word damaged to affected. And I would just say, you know what? What is your fear level on a level from 1 to 10 every single day? Mm -hmm. how often are you able to express your truth on a, on a, from one to 10 every single day, you know, and let's not use damage, but there are many ways to check if you're in a trauma bond. I have a, um, actually a test on my site, nadinemacaluso.com, where you can test if you're in a trauma bond and Roberta has resources. I have resources. And some of the effects that you might display are you second guess yourself, you self doubt yourself, you're fearful to do things that you used to want to do. There's a lack of joy in your life. You feel very confused. Your partner behaves one way, but says another. So yeah, there are ways to see that. And it sounds like you're already on your way to healing. Mm -hmm. That's that question. Asking good questions is a really good starting point. Really good start. Yeah, and and I've put the the um, URL up for contacting Nadine and finding all the good things she has for you. I have tons of resources on my website that are free. Go yes. use them. Yeah. Yeah, go use them for sure. And as Nadine said, I have one on my website. Uh, it's a check. Well, I have many, but it's a checklist of am I in a toxic relationship? And that can help you see that pretty quickly too. Yes, and this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It is just so, ending. <laughs> so put it into Instagram and see what comes up. Yes, and I know cannot be useful for many people, but I think for these these sorts of things, it can be helpful. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. Let's see what else is here. Um, I'm seeing how hypervigilant and untrusting of others and myself I have become as this has developed, but definitely taking my time. It has been respected in the new relationship. Great. Sounds good. We're for that. <laughs> Go slowly. <laughs> Go slow. Yeah. Trauma bonds usually a man wants to or a female, whoever your partner is, wants it to go quick. Well, that's one of the uh, hallmarks of hijackles. You know, they how quickly can I get you into my lair? <laughs> yes. How you know in in my book, Escaping the Hijackle Trap, I have a whole chapter called the Gotcha Factor, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Bec- because there there is that great need to get you. Right. I know. Um, Letter yeah. sent us a message here. I'm guessing that I'm feeling hurt and raw at the moment, yet at the same time, I'm conscious of the fact we have a nine year old. Also, I set the boundary the last time. Yeah. Yeah, it's an ongoing thing. It's just sometimes a bit like two steps forward and one step Mm -hmm. back. But remember, you're always making progress when you do that. And that's important for you to recognize. It may not be a speed that you want, but and you're so welcome. (laughs) Um, It may not be the speed that you want it to go at, but it is a the speed of change yes. sustained change right and right. healing is not linear you go like this 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 you know it's it's bumpy but it's okay keep doing it you're here you're 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 already aware you're conscious mm-hmm. and you're trying to raise your consciousness which is half the battle mm-hmm. so um there's been talk among people here but then we get this one 
Narcs are famous for taking pictures as you are unaware, and then they store the pictures. <laughs> and they will definitely do that. They will definitely do that to give themselves the edge over you at all times. That's the thing. You remember, they're very fearful humans. I know that sometimes they don't present as very fearful humans, but they are very fearful humans when you scratch them. Yes. So let's see. There's so many wonderful things. Oh. All right. Here's someone new. They get extreme joy from breaking you down and love to see your tears. Well, that is a quick way for them to tell that they struck a nerve and they acquired power over you. And they, you're right. They do like that. And that's a sadistic part, right? Because only people that are sadistic get joy from seeing other people's pain. And that's right. That's something you really want to be aware of and, you know, be hyper vigilant about that and put that in your cap and, you know, make note of that for sure. Yeah. Um, the important thing for us now is to say to everybody, we're so glad that you joined us. I know. And, so and uh, <laughs> that you've asked so many wonderful questions. Yes. Remember, too, that you can find Dr. Nadine Macaluso. You can find her at this website, nadinemacaluso.com, M-A-C-A-L-U-S-O.com. And remember all her free resources there for you. And she's... Uh, being my podcast guest so yes. we you can also find that so thank you so much for being with me oh, Nadine. thank you so much roberta i love talking to you i always have a great time and i always learn and your audience is lovely and guys don't give up you're here um, you um, know, and we got your back <laughs> on, yeah. you. Hi, roberta we're here for you. That's, That's why right. we get up in the morning. It's what That's flips right. our skirt and floats our boat. Isn't so we will do that for you. If you want to, con you know how to connect with Nadine, you can connect with me at Four Relationship Help. And in the meantime, know that every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific time, I do my podcast uh, live here. And you can join in after the podcast. We engage in a wonderful dialogue in the same way we have here. So make sure you go to my YouTube channel for relationship help and you know, youtube.com slash for relationship help. Subscribe and hit the notification button so you'll know every Monday night what we're talking about. And also, if you're on my Facebook page, go to facebook.com slash um, hijackles and or even better, go to facebook.com slash Save Your Sanity Podcast. And yeah. you, when you like that page, it will tell you also what's coming up on Mondays. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And Please thank you, Nadine. Have a great evening. Take care. Bye, Roberta. You too. Bye, Bye. Nadine. Again.